Perhaps I shouldn't say I'm surprised. I'm very disappointed at the numbers in the survey, but they're numbers that are reflected in other campuses across the country. And what this survey gave us was much clearer evidence of at least certain aspects of who is most affected and where is a lot of this occurring. You know, one of the things that come out of the survey is, you know, there are a good number of incidents in the residence halls. Now that's where a lot, not, not just proportionate relative to the number of students live there, but um, that says something about where we need to focus some attention and training. And there are a number of uh, incidents in the Greek system. You know, I think we might have suspected that, but we now have data on it. This is not stranger rape of someone jumping out of the bushes, right? Now that did happen on the path here east of town in a horrible event, but that's actually the least less common form of sexual assault for women on this campus. If you see something, do something. You know, try to intervene. Keep someone else from getting in trouble if, if it looks like that's happening. Now that's not always easy to do. There are a lot of incidents where there won't be anyone else around. We have to engage the individuals who are part of the behavior, right? And change behavior on the ground. As I have said, I am absolutely opposed to allowing concealed handguns into classrooms, into dorms, into Camp Randall. I'm the mother of a sophomore at Northwestern University. I wouldn't send her to a school where her, she could end up in a dorm room with someone with, with a gun in the room, right? I, I just wouldn't do that. Um, and I can't be the only parent who feels that way about safety on campus, particularly given the sort of shooting incidents combined with the problems that we and every other campus have on alcohol abuse, on large crowds. You know, this is one that I think we just, we have to talk very directly with, the, uh, uh, with our legislators and mobilize as many voices as we can to talk about the potential risks that we're running. As I say, I did not know in advance that that was going to happen in quite the way that it did. Um, once it happened, I don't think there was a lot of opportunities to change it. The real question was how quickly was the system going to respond? And they responded almost immediately, I say by, by putting um, into policy what had been in statute. The legislative process is always strange and wonderful. And it could, you know, as we learned, these things can be changed at any time. Um, I don't have any problems with this being in the general statute. Probably every university I've been at for my whole life up until now had this in the general statute. There were strong protections. A lot of faculty care very deeply for good reasons about the tenure protections at the university. And this is going to continue to generate a lot of attention and a lot of press. As you know, we raised out-of-state tuition um, this past year, and I have said this every time I've talked about it, and people often don't hear it, right, but I really, seriously, you always have to put up to 25% of any tuition increase back into scholarship aid, right, because um, you have to guarantee that tuition increases don't shut off your flow of lower-income students. A high share of our diversity comes from out-of-state. We work hard at in-state diversity, but we have to attract out-of-state diversity. If we want a Latino population here, you know, that is largely going to be out-of-state, right? I actually see expansions in our out-of-state um, admissions conditional on having the financial aid, which is a really important condition, can actually help us on the diversity front.